Hello Frontline Teach, this is Val Soul again, and I would like to spend some time with you today talking about how HIV is transmitted. First thing that you have to know is that HIV is hard to transmit. It's only transmitted in one of four body fluids, blood, semen, vaginal fluids, or breast milk. If you were here in front of me today, I would have you say them with me, but we're not, so I'm just going to say them again myself. Blood, semen, vaginal fluids, breast milk. Know those four body fluids like the back of your hand because those are the only four body fluids that transmit HIV. That's what we're going to be thinking about. Um, so not only does HIV have to be in one of those body fluids, it also has to get into someone else's bloodstream. And getting into the bloodstream is not an easy matter because HIV does not pass through unbroken skin. The skin is actually the body's biggest immune system organ and its whole job is to keep germs out. And by and large, it does a really good job of that. But there are three ways that HIV can bypass that and get into the bloodstream. First is direct blood to blood contact. We're really talking about needle use here. Um, the sharing of needles or razors, things that have access into one bloodstream and then are directly go into somebody else's bloodstream. Less direct than that is through open cuts, sores, or lesions. Um, and so the illustration here is a kid with a skin knee. That would be a place where HIV could get into the bloodstream because the, the skin on the outside is damaged. Less direct than that, um, is soft mucosal membranes and the key word here is mucus there. Um, the mucosal membranes are places like skin but that are less thick than skin. Vaginal and anal walls, inner cheek walls, tonsils. I could also put on this list the uh, inside of the nose or inside the the skin inside the eyelid but those places aren't likely to come into contact with blood, semen, vaginal fluids, or breast milk in the same way that these places are. So those are the three ways that HIV can get into the bloodstream. And anytime we're looking at a potential transmission or anytime we're looking and trying to help people prevent HIV, we want to think about what body fluid is involved, how would it get into the bloodstream, and how do we avoid that? So avoiding transmission first, Abstinence is an effective method of avoiding contact with other body fluids. Abstaining from sex, abstaining from substances that affect decision making, it's effective. But it's not universally realistic because many people don't abstain. There are still ways that we can protect ourselves and others even if we decide to have sex or use drugs. So. Uh, it's not the same for all people. There are many different ways to be exposed to these body fluids. There's a lot of different levels of exposure, um, and there are many different ways to keep ourselves safer. So we're going to go through one at a time, um, the different from ri most risky to least risky, different behaviors. Um, and this is what's known as harm reduction uh, or reducing harm. Uh, that symbol there is the international symbol for syringe exchange, uh, which is a, a really good example of harm reduction. And the philosophy of harm reduction is to look at the risk that someone faces in their life and change one piece of behavior that they can change, particularly if they're not ready to stop the behavior overall. The primary example that I want to use of this is of needles. Um, and if, uh, for instance, someone shoots drugs intravenously and doesn't want to stop shooting drugs intravenously but doesn't want to get HIV, we can make sure that they have access to clean needles and that's going to prevent the transmission of HIV until they're ready to make other decisions um, and make other changes in their lives. That's going to keep them safe from HIV. So the best is to use a clean needle every time. Um, but needles can be reused and cleaned with bleach and rinsed well with water uh, and that actually kills any germs that are inside the needle. 
um, accidental needle sticks, whether in on the street or in healthcare settings, do not need to cause a transmission. There's a protocol called post-exposure prophylaxis, uh, which we will talk about at a later time. Uh, but there are times in healthcare settings when people might be exposed to these four body fluids. And we use what's called universal precautions. That means if we're performing first aid on someone, we don't need to know their HIV status because we're going to act as if all blood universally has HIV in it and protect ourselves accordingly. So here's a picture of a couple people doing that. There's also the, the risk of blood contact during birth and the blood canal is a very bloody place. The birth canal, excuse me, is a very bloody place. Um, but we can reduce that risk too and a baby can be born and stay negative even if both of their parents are positive. That's another thing we'll spend more time on later in class. But the sort of next risky activity is unprotected receptive sex. It's less risky than blood to blood contact but it is riskier than any other sex act. And unprotected here means no latex or polyurethane barrier. So there's an exposure to body fluids. And receptive means you're the one being penetrated. Um, as we've talked about, HIV can get into the bloodstream through the vagina, anus, or mouth. So we have a happy couple here. They're getting it on. Honestly, I don't know from the illustration. I can't tell if it's protected or unprotected, but this person is the receptive partner. Uh, in this uh, scenario. So unprotected insert of sex is the second riskiest sex act. And insert of here means you're the one doing the penetrating. Uh, no matter what you've heard, it's definitely risky to be the insert of partner during sex, particularly if you have sores, cuts, or piercings on your penis or fingers. So having sores on your penis is actually, or on your, any of your genital, genitalia um, increases the risk of HIV because it's both an open sore and it's on a mucosal membrane. So that's actually a place where HIV can get into the bloodstream quite easily. Um, and so we return again to our happy couple uh, who are getting it on and that is the insertive partner. Um, and that person faces a risk in this unprotected encounter as well. I'm assuming it's unprotected. Now, protected sex is safer than unprotected sex. We have here a rocket with a condom on it. Um, it's, this is a very good example of harm reduction. Uh, vaginal, anal, or oral sex done with barriers. And barriers here are latex or polyurethane condoms, insertive condoms, dental dams, gloves. Uh, we'll be talking more about the specifics of safer sex later on. Um, but this is a common sense approach if you're going to have sex um, to do it as safely as you can because more power to you, you should get it on. Um, but if you don't know your partner's HIV status or if you do and they're positive, you can reduce the risk of having sex with them through the use of barriers. Now, no contact with body fluids equals no risk. Um, and even if you aren't in contact with body fluids, it might still count as sex. You know, we're not using the President Clinton definition of sex here. Uh, sex can take many forms, from kissing to dry humping to abstaining altogether. Um, all of those things have no contact with body fluids. Um, using clean needles every time also means you don't have any contact with body fluids. Uh, this uh, represents no contact with fluids here, the heavy petty and heart. Um, HIV cannot be transmitted by any of the following activities. It cannot be transmitted through unbroken skin, through kissing or hugging, through eating after a person or sharing utensils with them, through swimming in the same swimming pool or using the same toilet, shaking hands, coughing, sneezing, spitting, or through mosquitoes. In a later lesson, we will be examining some of the myths about HIV transmission to break them down using all the information that we just went over. Thank you, and I will catch you next time.